Amen. Thank you, every one of you, for being here tonight, being faithful to the house of God. You may be seated. Well, there's a plenty of sickness. The season is upon us, going around, and I got many texts and calls letting me know that they weren't, people weren't going to be here tonight, and, and so uh, I give you honor for being here tonight. It, it's a little bit cooler out all of a sudden, and I think it's going to be like that for a while. Get used to it. Just around the corner, the ladies' ministries is having their Christmas cookie walk and craft fair, and um, I know messages have gone out requesting bakers, and so um, if you can in any way support that effort uh, to bake cookies, to donate them, uh, it all goes towards Mother's Memorial, which is in support of missions, and so everything you do, even baking cookies, can bless the kingdom of God. Brother Monday, as I, I looked at the uh, slide on the screen before service of lives touched, um, I want you to know there's three more lives touched on that slide, celebrating the baptism of Annalise, Eliana, and Abram. Um, God is doing good work. I'm just looking ahead. This Sunday, I'm excited, and I'll share with you in advance. Sunday night, we have uh, Brother Hanthorn that's going to be with us. Pastors of church in Mequon, Christian Life Church. And last time he was here, he ministered such so powerfully on forgiveness. And I, I, I'm so grateful for his ministry and for what God is doing uh, through him and, and for his willingness to, to be a part of what God is doing here in Racine. And so uh, make plans for Sunday night if you haven't already. Be in church. 6 p.m. Uh, I want to pray God's blessing on the offering here tonight. Would you join me in that prayer? Jesus, we honor you with our lips, with our, our words of praise and adoration, God. We, we honor you with our presence just being here tonight. Lord, and I know there's many that cannot be here, not feeling well. I'm praying your blessing on them. Lord, I thank you for everyone who's watching the live stream right now that there would be a power and a presence in that living room, in that place, wherever they are, God, that, Lord, your, your mercy can be extended. And here tonight, Lord, I pray your blessing on the tithes and the offering, Lord, for everyone that gives. Lord, let there be a, a multiplication that takes place in their life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight I have a message to share with you that God has been sharing with me. And it never ceases to amaze me how many layers God has within his scriptures and within what he's doing in our midst. And as I see layer after layer and, and the, the threads that are, are woven interwoven with each other and even from service to service from week to week and and so tonight if you'd stand with me as we turn to second corinthians chapter 4 verse 17 this is actually a portion of scripture that we read on sunday morning when i preached to you about the house made without hands the house that's a spiritual house we sang about that house here tonight the house that will become the future dwelling place where our soul and spirit will dwell in the resurrection. And if we don't build the house, our future house, or let God build that house, the house made without hands, now there won't be a place for us to go when it's time. When the resurrection of the saints of God are, are caught away with him to meet in the clouds. Um, and so we, while we're not preaching on building that house tonight, there is another thread that you will see and probably have heard in more than one message as we read from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. And, and I, I hope that you will receive encouragement as I believe God wants to, to give all of us a fresh perspective on life and to reframe how we look at situations, whether they seem good or bad. 
2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Tonight when you walk through those doors, God had a plan in mind to give a fresh perspective and I wonder if we couldn't ask him right now if we could, if we could agree with that plan. Would you pray with me one more time? Would you ask God to speak to us here tonight? Jesus, we desire a fresh perspective. Lord, a, a word from you. That's what we need here tonight, God. And I'm asking that you would anoint it, Lord, that you would accomplish your will, that you would see that plan that you put into place come to fruition, Lord, in every one of our lives, individually and collectively as a body. I ask it in Jesus' name here tonight. Amen. You may be seated. I'm so grateful for our ability to record and to stream and to, to house all of the messages and, and song specials that go on in this sanctuary. And um, I know that there are obligations that some of us have and, and even ministry obligations that would cause us not to be able to, to be in every service. I, obviously, we, there's a group right now that are ministering uh, to the children in Power Hour that can't be here on a Wednesday night. And the same is true on Sunday mornings. And I'm grateful for the ability to record and to, to distribute that information. We used to have to put those on DVDs, or even before that it was cassettes. Yeah, I go back to the cassette ministry. I have, I have some cassettes somewhere. I don't know, I don't have anywhere to play them, but I have some. Um, I have a, a much larger collection of DVDs, and I don't even know if I have a way to play those. I probably do somewhere in the house. But we used to... Um, make a set of DVDs every week for the teachers that weren't in a service so that they wouldn't miss on whatever was going on. And I'm so grateful that uh, you never have to miss what's going on because it's not like we need more truth. But what we need to, we need to be a part of whatever God is doing to recognize the pieces and the threads that are, are woven together. And I'm so, I'm, I'm in awe of how God weaves this tapestry that he is before us and through us and at the very onset of this message here tonight, I want to tell you where we're going. I want to give you a very clear destination that we have in mind. Um, I don't want to build up to a big reveal. I want, to, I want you to know what is the intended outcome from this message. And so here it is. Our goal, both individually and collectively, is to change our perspective when it comes to what we would consider wins or losses. What if I told you tonight that, that even when you lose you can still win? What if every time you took a hit, with, what if that bruise that's left behind wasn't the sign of a defeat, but rather the sign of another victory? However you define success in this life, I'm sure you know how good it feels to win. You got the job you hoped for, that's a win. You got the spouse you dreamed of, that's a win. You taught your first Bible study and you saw a life transformed forever. That is a win. We love to win because it feels good to win, to get the victory, to, to see the rewards of our hard labor, whatever it is. But what if even when you didn't win, you still actually won? How great would that be if every time you lost, you actually won. What would it feel like? What would life be if when we suffer the pain of loss, there's a win in place of that feeling? I'm telling you up front, this is where the Lord is wanting to take us tonight to equip us to win even when we suffer loss. I know there's, there's already a, a feeling of hesitation rising up as someone's thinking to themselves. I'm not sure that's how it works. How could this be? How could painful loss ever be counted as a win? It's hard in part to consider losses as wins because we've learned that in many examples, in, in every sporting event, when two teams come to challenge each other, 
One is victorious and they go home with the win and the other is defeated and they go home with the loss. When it comes to a war between countries, when they go into battle, there's one that's going to come out victorious and one that is not. And of course, all of this is still true, but even when it's true through this perspective that we have of the things in this world, I'm asking you tonight to allow God to show you another perspective. It's a perspective like we read in our opening text in verse 17, and and so if I could, if I could read that same portion of scripture to you in a different translation from the, the ESV version or translation, it, it may help us to have even more clarity. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 in the ESV says, For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory that's beyond all comparison. Whatever uh, losses we incur in this life, it is a light loss, a momentary loss, that's preparing us for an eternal reward that has great weight and glory beyond all comparison. Sometimes when I'm, I'm trying to understand a scripture, I, I'll, I'll use my Bible app and I'll just start clicking through different translations. And I, I did that a couple times on this verse and I found in the New Living Translation this Similar text, same text, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, New Living Translation says, For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. I would guess that most of us, we can nod our head in agreement with this concept that we're even familiar with this specific verse and somehow, though, our awareness and knowledge of what the Bible says sometimes doesn't actually accomplish everything that the Bible says that we know to be true. And there are many times when we only see the loss, when we only feel the pain. The challenge we face in those times is that, is that while we know in our minds this is what the Bible says, our hearts, our emotions haven't caught up with what we know to be true. We can say, I, I believe it, Jesus, I believe your word, but I I'm having a hard time feeling it. Because we feel what we perceive. Let me say that again. We, we have a hard time aligning our heart with what we know the Word of God says to be true because we feel what we perceive. And in those times of loss, it's hard to recalibrate our hearts and minds so that they are in sync. Because our perception goes hand in hand with our perspective. How we see things presently is our perception, the here and now, and, and that will inform how we see things going forward, our perspective. Perception is so powerful. It, it, it defines the reality that, that we live. It's inescapable. You, we, we can't get away from the lens of our own perception. But the Lord our God has given us humans a superpower that he did not give any other part of creation. While every other animal operates based on instinct, mankind has the ability to think, to contemplate, to imagine, and even to reframe our thoughts. That's what, kind of what we do every time we gather together for a service like this. We assemble in part just to allow the Lord and his word to cause us to think differently to imagine things that are unseen, to contemplate the possibilities and to allow his word to inform us or reinform us. And so if you turn your Bibles with me next to Romans chapter 8, verse 18, and as we read this portion of scripture, I want you to look for the reframing of our very present perception of the right here, right now, in contrast to the perspective of what's to come. Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, what I'm feeling right here, right now, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us, looking ahead to what we're going to experience. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth, that creature is, is us, our flesh, 
the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God, the sons of God being us in the spirit. This is, this is the same contrasting picture that Brother Giwa preached to us on Sunday night. Slaves and sons. The creature being us in the flesh and the sons being us in the spirit. Slaves and sons. This flesh is the bond servant and the spirit we cry, Abba, Father, and we are both. The scriptures say that though our outward person perish, our inward person is renewed day by day. We grow stronger. And if you'll allow me just to read these, these next few verses in Romans chapter 20 out of a, a different translation, I'd like to read to you out of the NASB, New American Standard Bible. And I do that because the King James is especially difficult to untangle in this particular portion of scripture. And so um, you can follow along in your Bibles or, or just listen in to Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 20. For the creation, that's our flesh, was subject to futility. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption. That's that same slavery Brother Giwa spoke about Sunday night. set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only that, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for the adoption as sons and daughters, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, though, through perseverance we wait eagerly for it. We reframe our perception of the here and now through the anticipation of what's to come. A comparison, a contrast, uh, an understanding that there is a, a weight of this flesh that just is like slavery. But there is a freedom in the spirit that is eternal and forever and far greater than any weight of this flesh. And when our present sufferings feel like a loss, the Bible says that we ought to reframe our perception of the present through the lens of the future. In patience, eagerly waiting upon for that day to come. And to help us claim the win, even when all we can see and all we can feel is a loss. Verse 26 goes on to give us a prescription to fill to exercise the Spirit of God in us, to free us from the here and now so that we can have a view of the things that are unseen, the things that are yet to come, the things that we hope for because if we saw them, we wouldn't be hoping for them. They'd be here and now. Verse 26 of Romans chapter 8 says, Now in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness for we do not know what to pray for as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Every time we exercise the gift of God's Spirit in us, praying in a language we never learned, speaking in tongues, God's Spirit is uttering words, groanings that are too deep for us to even comprehend because God's Spirit knows exactly what we need and have need of and is praying according to his perfect will. And while the groanings that we groan may have started because of some suffering, some loss, some hurt, and, and we absolutely should exercise our, our, our understanding and, and praying in a language, our own language, English, to tell the Lord all about all of our feelings. He, he wants us to be able to confide in him, to, to even share our own truth. He already knows what we're feeling, but there's something in confession that empowers us, enlightens the load. And, and after we've expressed our feelings in a language we understand, then we absolutely need to shift to a language we don't understand and to allow God's Spirit to speak through us, praying in the Spirit as the Spirit gives the utterance, speaking in a language you never learned. And when we faithfully fill this prescription to pray in the Spirit, when we continually allow God to speak things that are too deep for us to, to speak or to understand, then the things that we don't understand that we saw as a loss, that feeling can be replaced with a feeling of hope. Not 
the power of, of positive thinking, but the power of God's Spirit working in us. And if we continue to read that same portion of Scripture in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and we know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. I believe the the predestined part of Romans chapter 8 isn't a list of people who God has specially picked to be saved, to be the called, versus those who didn't get picked, who are the lost. I, I believe this portion of Scripture is saying to us that there is a path that God has preordained or predestined, a path that if followed anyone and everyone can be saved. It's a path that according to his purpose, when God sacrificed himself, when he died on the cross, when that innocent blood was shed to pay the price of sin, God He didn't just pay the price of the sin of a few chosen people. He paid the price for the sins of the world so that there would be a freedom and a liberty not to wonder, like, is is this covered? Is this, am I in a place where I can be restored, renewed, where I can trust in the word of God? The answer is yes. That whosoever would want to come could come to be a part of his eternal kingdom. And God, he predestined a way for every person if they choose to obey and follow him, a path that will cause us to be conformed to his image, to become a reflection of Jesus. And if that wasn't enough, the, the scriptures, the Bible, is, is filled with promises, blessings. We, we have so much to be grateful for. Sometimes I, I, I think we forget how good we have it. And then when we suffer some loss in our lives, whether it be a loss of a loved one or a, a loss of some relationship, some friendship, a loss could be even of our own, our own good health, a loss of something we value in this world, what, whatever the source of pain or whenever we suffer a loss, the Word of God says the sufferings of this present time, what we're feeling right here, right now, they are not worthy to be compared to the glory of which shall be revealed in us, looking ahead to where we're going and what we're going to experience. God's saying, I need you to reframe your perspective so that even when you you lose, you still win. It's that same pulling down of the strongholds of our mind and bringing every thought into the captivity of the knowledge of God. Tonight I want to share a story with you about a man named Nick Vucizic. Nick was born in Melbourne, Australia in 1982. He was born to his parents who were Serbian immigrants from Yugoslavia, now living in Australia. And, and Nick was born with a, a syndrome called ter- Tetra Amelia Syndrome. It's a rare disability characterized by the absence of arms and legs. Nick, Nick was born with just a torso, a head, a neck, and uh, he calls it his chicken wing. It's kind of like a foot. And according to his autobiography, this is written by Nick in one of his many books, his mother refused to see him or hold him immediately after his birth. She and her husband, who happened to be a pastor, even left him in the hospital unsure of what had just happened. As Nick grew up, he was bullied at school because of his condition. At the age of 80, he even tried to take his own life because from where he sat, he thought he'd never have a real life. He'd never get married. He'd never be able to work and make money. And even at the age of eight, he was saved from drowning himself in the bathtub. And and while his parents initially struggled with the grief and confusion about his condition, they realized God doesn't make mistakes. And so they raised Nick to look at the the bright side of life and to trust God in every situation and to never give up no matter how difficult life becomes. By age 17, Nick started to give inspirational talks at schools and church-sponsored events. At age 21, he graduated from the university and he, he went on to author multiple books. His first book entitled Life Without Limits, Inspiration for a Ridiculously Good Life. 
That book has now been translated into 30 languages and is published across the globe, selling millions of copies. Today, he lives in California with his wife and his four children. In one of his talks, he shared that while he'll never hold the hand of his wife, and he, he <laughs> so charismatic and so nonchalant, juggly, because I have no hands. He can't hold his wife's hands, literally. He said that he knows how to hold her heart. Doesn't require any hands at all. Nick is an international speaker and he teaches about the love of God that goes beyond our limitations and he tells listeners the secret to living a good life is to live a life in a state of thankfulness to God. Every day we need to thank God for the good and the bad. In his talk, he explains that there are some things we just simply cannot control. But what we can control is what we think and how we respond to the things that are outside of our control. And so turn in your Bibles next with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. Here we read a call to take action, to not let time go by or expire on our hurt feelings, on our, our losses. It's the same advice Nick gave to those that listened to one of his talks. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15, it says, See then that you walk circumspectly, or to be careful how you walk, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming or making the most of the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be not unwise, but understand what is the will of the Lord. Here's the will of the Lord, to, to be not drunk with wine, where is in excess, but to be filled with the Spirit. How do you do that? You speak to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And here's the secret, giving thanks always for all things unto God the Fa and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. To be thankful, to express gratitude to the one true God for everything and everything and anything, not just the good things, but everything. Because God's will is taking place right here, right now. And even when our scoreboard says we've suffered a loss, his scoreboard shows win after win after win. There, there's a small word here we, we read in verse 20 that's um, actually misinterpreted in the King James, and it's the word and, A-N-D. As we read, it says, give thanks always for all things unto God and the Father. And if you'll allow me just to step sideways for a minute, I want to give you a powerful key to unlock the oneness of God within the scriptures. The word and should have been the word even, which is in fact correctly translated in some other translations. And every time you read something that says God, the Father, and Jesus Christ, I want you to take your pen out and I empower you to cross and out in your Bible and to write in the word even. Give thanks always for all things unto God, even the Father, Jesus Christ. I know we're not preaching oneness here tonight, but it's, it's never out of order to proclaim this truth. As we, as we turn to our next portion of Scripture, we'll, we'll see the same word misinterpreted. If you turn with me then to Philippians chapter 1, verse 2. Philippians chapter 1, verse 2. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, even the Lord Jesus Christ. Doesn't that make so much more sense? God our Father, even Jesus Christ, because he's the Father, he's the Son, he's the Holy Ghost. There's one God. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. That sounds like thankfulness. Every time I think of you, I thank God for you. Always, in every prayer of mine for you, all making requests with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Verse 6 gives us a key to change our perspective. When that feeling, when feelings swamp, swamp us with the very present pain and suffering of loss, that's when we need to go back to the book and, and to look past the temporal things and to see the eternal things and have confidence in not the scoreboard of this life as we see it, but confidence since God started this in me, started me on this path in his kingdom. He's made a way for me to make it all the way. I, I know this 
whatever situation looks like it could take everything from me or put me in a place where I'll never be able to be restored, but God has made a way and he will make a way. He will complete what he started. Sometimes when we suffer the pain of loss, that, that loss can uproot all sorts of things that are all around it. Things that were planted nearby that, that weren't in themselves uprooted, but were now displaced, or at least, at the very least, exposed. For example, if someone who is very close to you walks away from God, their, their choice to self-destruct can cause someone close to them to, to question what they believe. And especially if they looked up to that person, and, and even more so if that person played a role in their own journey into the kingdom. Sometimes our, our losses, they look like those kinds that are completely outside of our control, but now we are feeling uprooted because of someone else's choice. And in other cases, sometimes we play a role in our own hurts, our own losses, our own consequences of choices we've made, right or wrong. And I can tell you it's still God's will. He knows how to turn a bad situation into a good one, to, to produce something in us that wasn't there before. Even when we are playing a role in a choice we've made that results in a loss or hurt. And oftentimes it's a combination of both things that are outside of our control and things that are in our control, choices we've made. And, and so let me give you an example. If you were to put me as your pastor up on a pedestal, or, or worse, if I was to put myself up there, acting as if I'm incapable of making mistakes, then when I make a mistake because I'm human, you might suffer the hurt of a loss because now you don't know if you can trust a pastor who makes mistakes. Or, or trust someone that said something wrong at the wrong time. Can I, can I make a personal request of you right now? Well, you have to go with it because I'm here and you're there. Um, let me just make this request and, and tell your friends. If I ever do anything to hurt you or that causes you to suffer, would you first please come to me and, and please give me the opportunity to make it right? And second, we can all be reassured that through my humanity, we're all in good company. Because now you don't have to beat yourself up, knowing that I'm made of the same flawed flesh and that there is no special dispensation for ministers. Jesus Christ was made of the same flesh, yet he's the only one without sin. Hebrews 4 and 15 says, For, for we have not and high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Now, I, I've come to understand what that scripture says, but when you read it in the King James English, and I'm sorry I'm beating up on the King James English tonight. It's, we just caught these scriptures, and if my job is to teach the word of God what it says, sometimes the KGV gets in the way just a little bit. And so here in verse 15, there is a double negative. If you actually read the words closely, it can be a little confusing. It says, we have not a high priest that cannot relate to our struggles, which means we have a high priest that can relate to our struggles, to our human condition. Jesus understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings that we do, yet he did it without sin. As your pastor, I promise to do everything in my ability to do what's right, to to be led of the Spirit and not of my flesh, to be sensitive to the voice of the Lord, and, and to live a life that, that is worthy of emulation at whatever level I can to the best of my ability. But the fact is that I'm part of the fallen human race. And because of that, I, that comes with the potential that I will at some point let you down. But Jesus Christ is the example that will never let you down. He's the rock that we can stand on and build on and, and trust in. We all are aspiring to become a reflection of his image, myself included. We're all fellow strugglers, and, and so we have that in common. 
Turn your Bibles, if you would, with me next to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. When you're faced with the reality of a loss in life, when you, you feel like you don't know if you can keep going, here's, hear the word of the Lord tonight. The word of God says that when you've done all to stand, stand some more. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 says, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So here's another checkpoint. When, when your feelings start to betray yourself, when you don't know if you can keep going, step one, check to make sure you've put on the armor of God. Verse 12 goes on to say, for we wrestle not just against flesh and blood, as if that wasn't enough, right? As if ourselves wasn't a big enough enemy to tackle every, each and every day. But in addition to that, we wrestle also against principalities and powers and against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There are powers that are conspiring against us, whether we realize it or not. Systems and ways of man and the culture that we live in, and we've shared some of those 21st century strongholds with you in recent days. And because of that, verse 13 says, Wherefore, Take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, or stand some more. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having a breastplate of right, on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. How do you exercise that, that sword in battle? Verse 18 says, we draw our swords out when we pray in the Spirit, when we exercise the rima, right now words of God, words uttered through His Spirit, words that are perfectly aligned with His will. Verse 18, and take the sword of the Spirit, which is that Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance, and supplication for all saints. And when you've done all that you think you can do to stand, stand some more. And I'd like to share with you another story of an overcomer like Nick. Um, he's an incredible minister named Darren Sargent. He's part of the United Pentecostal Church International, and he was born with only one arm. And I've heard him say, his missing arm is the greatest gift God has ever given him. Why? <laughs> what do you mean? And, and uh, you know, in, in case there's someone that's listening that has been born without some part of your body, like Brother Sergeant, or like the testimony of Nick that I shared earlier, I want you to know that the Lord our God did not make a mistake when he created you. And Brother Sergeant, he was born with a unique gift, only having one hand, and and through his own admission, it has only helped him to see life from a different perspective, maybe different than most. And he'll tell you that, as we all are aware, life is full of challenges. And how we approach those challenges will determine the direction and the success of our lives. Brother Sargent has gone on to, to share his testimony and to speak all over the world. And recently he published a, a book entitled Battle of the Beast, Defeating the Lions That Oppose Your Destiny. In his book, he speaks about 12 different lions that could come against our potential. And when Brother Sargent was asked, of those 12 different lions, which is the most important, without hesitation, he answered, the most important lion to deal with is fear. It's the underlying challenge that feeds all the other lions. Brother Sargent went on to say that fear breeds doubt and insecurity and anxiety, and when fear takes a hold, it has the power to paralyze us hindering our progress, afraid to move forward. Fear keeps us from taking the necessary steps towards success, and that's why confronting and conquering fear is paramount to our purpose. Tonight, as the musicians come, there's one last example of how our losses on earth can still be a win, but it requires us to overcome a level of fear. It's allowing the losses that we've overcome in life to be a testimony to someone about their future win. 
The challenge that holds us back at times from exercising this kind of win is that in order to exercise it, it requires us to revisit what may be a scar in our life, one that was left there from a hurt, from a loss that took place. And, and even though God has, has delivered us and encouraged us and strengthened us to give us a, a, our own perspective, when we revisit that testimony, it requires us to revisit that scar. And oftentimes in the moment, it doesn't feel like a win when we go back to that place. But then through our testimony, there is a win that the kingdom of heaven gets in addition to the win that we got before. And as the kingdom of heaven claims a win, well then we indirectly claim a win. And so you could call it a win-win, but there's a step of selfish selflessness within ourselves that has to take place that has to precede the kingdom win and oftentimes it it's a dismantling maybe of our pride coupled with a willingness to be transparent and all of that adds an incremental cost to the ledger of our life on a bill that we just don't want to revisit that was taken care of I, i'd rather forget about it in my past but nonetheless, when we come to minister to someone through, the, through that testimony, through the loss and pain that we suffered and the, the win that was gained, surely what was a loss will become a win all over again through the power of that testimony. Tonight, if you'd stand with me as I read to you our last scripture from Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. We're talking about reframing our perspective so that even when we lose, we win. Revelation 12 and 10 speaks to the perspective of what's to come. One way that we can reframe the here and now into the what's around the corner. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Perhaps the accuser is pointing to the pain of those losses that we've suffered. Sometimes pointing to that pain to say, look, you, you, you shouldn't even be here. You don't deserve any of this. You certainly can't minister to somebody else. Look at the, the tattered life that you once had. But they overcame him. They overcame the accuser by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. So as you see, it's, it's not a hypothetical question. What if every hurt and every pain could become a win? It's a fact that in God's economy, in his kingdom, it's win, win, win. It doesn't matter if it seems good or bad. It's a win. Like the Bible says, you thought it for evil, but God, he thought it for good. Tonight, as we open up this altar, I wonder if you don't have some losses that you'd like to trade to trade in for wins tonight. God, let me see this from a different light, from a different perspective. God, let me understand that whatever little happens here is so small in comparison to what's going to happen and the promises and the glory that's to come. And Lord, even as I suffer losses and you give me the power to overcome, Lord, let me not be afraid to share my testimony of the goodness of God. It's a win and another, and another. Would you come tonight? to